Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malav Yumim in Israel. Every once in a while, we experience moments of extreme clarity. These precious jewels of life tend to come at unexpected times, seemingly uncalled for and rather spontaneous. There may not appear to be any cause for this experience. It just seems to happen out of the blue, like a bright light getting turned on in the midst of darkness. These moments may not lead to life transformations of the sort that one might expect from such, such experiences. They be, may be nothing more than a brief glimpse of the beauty of nature or some flash of insight into an otherwise unimportant aspect of life. But they also could be the impetus for one of those great transitions that we vaguely seek out but are never quite sure how to find. They could result in a new understanding of one's purpose in life or into the nature of some deep relationship with another. Such revelations are rare. They should be, since that is what makes them so precious. We may wonder at times why it is that we cannot simply dial up something in the mind to make these experiences happen at will in the same way, they, same way that we can connect to a website. It may seem that it's just flipping a mental switch of some sort, and there we are. But we all know that nothing could be further from the truth. There is no switch to flip. Even if there was, it would be no simple matter of pressing a button. It would be some process of intense and sustained meditation and introspection. These moments of clarity appear to many of us as more like a gift from above than a well-deserved reward. This week's Parsha is called Kitisa. That phrase means, when you lift an odd expression that refers to the procedure of counting the Israelites for an upcoming census. Following this comes details about the anointing oil and incense that would be used in the tabernacle, and then a brief repetition of the commandment to keep the Shabbat. Right after that, it gets in, into the real issue of the Parsha, the golden calf. We won't go into all the details of this rather long and destiny-changing event, Suffice it to say that it was the greatest spiritual downfall of the entire Torah and the single incident that set the Israelites on a course of needing to pick up the pieces of a partially failed mission. It was a colossal collapse back into the idolatry that they were supposed to have left behind in Egypt. It was an incident of spiritual failure, falling back into an image of God that was physical and tangible, as opposed to the purely spiritual and transcendental image that they ex had experienced at Mount Sinai and elsewhere in the wilderness. Instead of all those details, we are going to focus on the aftermath of the golden calf. The immediate consequence of it all was that the Israelites were somehow diminished in their status as a people of destiny and forced to recognize their failure for what it was. A consequence of this was that Moshe alone was to be the intercessor with God. His status was greatly elevated in their eyes. He set his tent outside of the main encampment. It was called the tent of meeting, a phrase that would be used frequently in the various descriptions of the tabernacle after it was erected. This first tent of meeting was not part of the tabernacle at all, however. It was Moshe's somewhat private place of communion with God or of teaching his instructions to the Israelites. It was in this tent of meeting that one of the most remarkable interactions between God and a person ever recorded in human literature took place. This interaction seems to emerge almost without prompting from the text. It begins with Moshe asking a series of requests of God, apparently to mitigate some of the damage done by the golden calf incident. The first, concerns how the Israelites would get to the Promised Land, specifically what divine providence they would have on the journey. The second seems to be a more personal request for Moshe. He requests of God that, quote, you tell me your ways and I will know you in order that I find grace in your eyes and yet you view the Israelites as your people. God's response to these requests is that some divine presence or face will go with them on the journey and lead them. Moshe then seems to doubt this very promise by saying, quote, if your presence does not go, then do not move us from here. For how can I know that I have found grace in your eyes if not in your going with us and in myself and your people becoming distinguished from all peoples on the earth? 
God then confirms this promise. Following this rather strange dialogue, Moshe then gets into what seems to be the main point of his series of requests. Quote, show me please your glory. This apparently outrageous request is met with surprising agreement, but not quite in the way Moshe may have expected. God responds, quote, I will pass all of my goodness in front of you, and I will call in the four-letter name before you, and I will show grace to whom I show grace, and mercy to whom I show mercy. God continues with an abrupt switch that seemingly puts everything on ice. Quote, you cannot see my presence, for no person can see my presence and live. This apparent denial of Moshe request is then adjusted a bit. There is a place, quote, there is a place associated with me, and you shall stand on a rock. As my glory passes, I will place you in a cleft in the rock and shield you with my palms until I pass. Then I will remove my palms and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This amazing monologue is stated right in the Torah, though the translation of a, of a few key words is subject to dispute. Specifically, the words for presence or face and for back are the subjects of great debate. In addition, this place that was somehow associated with God is frustratingly vague. What is this place? Was it some rock out in the Sinai wilderness that was somehow God's unique location in the world? Then there is the problem of God's palms, an obviously metaphorical term since Judaism grants no physical form to God. Finally, there's the problem of Moshe's initial request and its resolution. What was the request and how was it finally granted or denied? Was Moshe able to see God's glory or not? These are among the most difficult verses of the entire Torah to interpret. Countless biblical commentators through the ages have attempted to explain them in some way. The pinnacles of both Jewish philosophy and Jewish mysticism have found expression through these verses. We shall attempt to explain them in a manner which sticks as close as possible to the actual words of the text and yet remains faithful to Jewish tradition. This will not be a walk in the park. First, it must be remembered that only a few parshas ago, Moshe and many of the elders were granted a vision of God. This vision was described with analogies of the clarity of a sapphire and of the essence of the heavens. Why was that vision granted with no prompting from a request while this one was partially denied? The answer to this question takes us into the different ways of imaging God. The early image was that of what is called Elohim, the way that God is seen as the omnipotent force behind nature. That image can be seen if one looks in the right way. This image that Moshe requested here was of an entirely different nature. It was to see God's actual glory, the reality of God not through the lens of nature. As wonderful and as beautiful as nature can be, it remains physical and limited. God's true essence has no such limitations. This is what Moshe hoped to catch a glimpse of. God both granted this request and partially denied it. God allowed him, among all people, to see an image of God's true reality. But since it is impossible for a person, a mere creation, to ever see such an image, it had to be obstructed in some way. To see God as God actually is, and not through some lens, is to see all of reality as the complete and perfect unity that it truly is. This is impossible for anything that is part of that reality and immersed within it. To exist or to live is to be part of reality. To be God is to be the source of existence and thus not really exist in the same sense at all. To accomplish this partial vision, God would have to shield Moshe from the true unobstructed reality. This was done by placing Moshe in a certain situation or place that would facilitate such protection. It happened to be a rock with a cleft in it, but presumably it could have been almost anywhere. It simply had to be something where Moshe was still attached 
to the firm grounding of the world. God's palms are God's way of enabling motion to see, but not to see, like a person attempting to stare at the sun through the palms of their hands. What about that business of seeing the back and not the face? We see things through our eyes, which stare out from the front of the face. We see nothing from the back. It is a form of vision that is completely obscured from us. These two different points of view are used here to explain the vision which Moshe was granted. He was not able to see things the way God sees things, having a complete and perfect perspective of all reality and what it all means. He was only able to see things in the way that God doesn't see things, from the back. Thus, his vision was that of a human being who was able to understand things from the limited perspective of a creation. This is not God's perspective of reality. It is the reality of God as seen from one who is not God. This is God's glory as revealed to creation. Visions like this don't come every day. It was perhaps a once-in-all-history experience, which was recorded in the Bible as the supreme experience of God. But that doesn't mean that each and every one of us cannot experience our own version of this vision. This is a prototype of the God experience, that unique moment in life when we are truly alive and truly conscious of the ultimate reality, whatever that may mean to us. Why aren't we seeking such a moment? Why aren't we preparing ourselves so that when it, when it finally happens, we are ready and willing participants in the moment? We may not be able to see God's true glory and still live in the world. Nevertheless, to be truly alive is to gain some true experience of God's reality. Shabbat Shalom.